Dragon's Den is open for business. I don't often say this, but your pitch was awful. You've got to be quiet for this little bit, Peter, if that's all right. Ouch. A place where budding entrepreneurs are given a once-in-a-lifetime chance. You have this most bizarre way of answering questions. <laughs> no, 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 stop it. To present their wares to five captains of commerce. You wanted to see how credible we are, yeah. so I'm about to show you. Well, show me. Some will succeed and go on to make millions. <laughs> Others will fail and leave with nothing. Make him a counter offer. Tell him to shove it where the sun doesn't shine. The hunt is on to find the next big money-making idea. Dragons are go. <laughs> Tonight. This might have been a fatal mistake to put your dragons to sleep before we start the pitches. So you have not got an exclusive in the UK on... He hasn't got exclusive at all. I think it's a terrible business, Peter, and I think you're probably best off just declaring that you're out. OK, Ooh, so you quite so like it. likes it. Unfortunately, business is business. Abia, I have to say I do agree with Tuga. Finally! Whoa! That was a good job I was sitting down for that. Finally! My name is Gina. I'm 30 years old and I am originally from Lebanon. You're gonna do so well, Gina. Thank you. I think it's a manicure set. Do you wear nail polish? No. A lot of men wear nail polish now. Does Paul wear nail polish? No, because it chips when he's doing the horses. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of sweat and a lot of blood and a lot of tears to get this product to market. I remember there was a Christmas where I was literally mixing gels and crying at the same time, so literal tears have gone into this product. Hello, dragons. My name is Gina, and I'm the founder of Clays. I'm here today to ask for £100,000 in return for a 4% stake in my business. Growing up during a turbulent time in Lebanon, manicures became the ultimate form of self-care for me. But when I started working in finance, I rarely had time to go to the salon, and I was terrible at painting my own nails. So I wanted to come up with a better way, and that's where Glaze comes in. Glaze is on a mission to disrupt the nail care industry by giving consumers more sustainable, salon-quality manicures at a fraction of the cost and time of existing solutions. Our hero product is our made-to-measure stick-on gels. Customers choose their favorite color or design and submit a few pictures of their hands. Using our patent-pending technology, we are able to create a fully custom-sized manicure that is delivered directly to our customer's letterbox. All you need to do is stick them on and you're good to go. To remove them, you simply peel them off. Since soft launching just six months ago, we've generated over 40,000 pounds in sales with minimal marketing. And we're now ready to take place to the next level. And I hope you join us on our journey. Thank you. Stick-on gels made to fit your unique nail size and shape is the offering from Gina Farron. You've done a great job, I'd say. She's looking for 100,000 pounds what about these? I think you've done a better job. Oh! oh well, you, you know gonna, why? Can I have a look? He's used to it. In return, she'll give away a 4% stake in her business. What's happened here, Sarah? Do you want, do you want me to finish them off? Or... Don't you, don't no, let me you touch Sorry. them. Let me finish it off. Don't you I'm <laughs> shown yet. They look quite good, to be fair. They do. While Queen of Crafting, Sarah Davies, admires her handiwork, Nail novice Peter Jones is keen to learn more. Gina, hi. Hi. When I, when I first saw them and put them on, yeah. I thought that these would be in a similar way to sort of false nails. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't, is it? Because this is ultimately just to replace the part that where you paint your nails. Correct, for now, yes. So, in, in essence, then, it's a coloured sticky label on a nail. Well... You could say that, yes, but the way we've looked at the product formulation and the reason it's been hard for us to do is because we wanted to create a product that actually looked like a gel, 
as opposed to a sticker that mimics a gel. Can I just ask a question to the ladies? Because mm -hmm. obviously I don't use, I don't paint my nails. Or do... We can see that. But from your perspective, putting that on your nail, would you prefer to put something sticky on your nail like that or do you prefer to paint your nails? I think it's a terrible business, Peter, and I think you're probably best off just declaring that you're out. Ooh, okay, so you quite so like likes it. it. Gina. Yes. Hi, I'm Hi. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, this was not at all like what I was expecting. I've never heard of anything like this. I mean, it's... It, if it is as good as what you said it is, oh, my mm. word, are you going to disrupt this industry? And then some. I mean, it sounds incredible. So, is anyone else doing stick-on nails made to measure like this? So there is a company called Manimi in the US that has a similar kind of product where you actually have to take pictures of their hands. So there's a company in the US who is doing exactly the same thing or almost the same thing? In terms of the sizing, they are doing something very similar. Yes, yep. so you can order made to measure stick on gels. Okay, so is their product patented? Yes. Okay, and what is it that you have the patent application for? So what we're claiming for is how we convert the 2D mask that we extract from, um, from the images you submit into the final made-to-measure template. OK, and what's their claim on their patent? Because this business will live or die on its intellectual property. Yeah. So I just need to understand how watertight it is yeah. versus the competition that's out there. Yeah, so we've... Basically, we have different approaches to get to a similar product. I think both patents should be valid, but I'm not a patent expert. That's why we have the lawyers. So, um, Gina, I, I just want to... I really want to get my mind wrapped around the comparisons between what currently happens and the sustainability piece. I'm, Absolutely. Because I can see, looking at Sarah's nails, I mean, they are a great alternative, but the reason I would prefer that is if it's better in terms of the environment than the existing, than the, yeah. what we currently do. Yeah. So what are, you know, why would I feel better about them buying this product than, the, the, you know, getting their nail polish and doing it themselves? Yeah. So I'm not going to greenwash. Um, That's a really good start. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I will say is that at the moment, uh, we've done what we can in terms of the bio-based content. We haven't yet done the end-of-life tests to truly understand how this compares to a gel product. However, because we have a great formulation chemist, we're going to try and get to a place where the product is a lot more sustainable than anything else that's, that's out there. OK, well, that's, that's a good answer, because actually that's the answer the consumer wants to hear. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. Everybody has an impact. Yeah. Are you on the journey? Do you really intend to get better, to make this better than we currently are? Yeah. So, you've come in here with a valuation of, what, two and a half million? Right? Turned over 40,000. So, I want to explore a, a few things. So, yeah. your background is what prior to this? Uh, in investment banking. Right, hence the fact the valuation. <laughs> so, if we look at the 40,000, yeah. for, for example, yeah. before we consider, so your gross profit is how much? 34,000. 34,000. And I guess you, you've lost money in, in the first year? Or? Yeah, so we, because we've had to invest heavily in the product and we built our own factory, we've... So how much have you invested totally? So we've invested around 800,000. How much? 800,000 pounds in the business. Eight hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, we've raised money from uh, institutional investors and business angels. Wow, wow! And out of the eight hundred thousand you've collected, how much have you got left? Uh, around one hundred and fifty thousand. So is this investment part of a bigger round? Yeah, we've already closed two hundred k from existing investors, and what the business will need overall is five hundred thousand. And, us, and what were the terms of the 200k that you closed from existing investors? Yeah, so uh, the valuation was 5 million, actually, as opposed to the 2.5. So I knew that the valuation was going to be a bit of a hairy topic today, so I came in slashing it by 50%. Good. Still steep, <laughs> still steep if you ask me. Yeah. With 40k in sales, to have a 2.5 million valuation. I, I agree that if you look at the valuation, just with the sales we've got, it is ridiculous. I totally agree. What? Yes. Yeah. But <laughs> but what you're investing in is not the sales because we've had to scale up 
cautiously to make sure that we're not losing control of, of the quality. So uh, we didn't want to go out of the gate and just go crazy on the marketing and then have issues. OK. I'm going to tell you where I am. Um, you know, Sarah, Sarah's reaction was really did influence me a lot because I did my nails quite badly. I, I don't understand the problem as well as I'm sure Sarah um, does from what she said. But I don't think that's enough for me, unfortunately, in this case. I don't think that's enough for me to part with my money. So for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. But I wish you the very best. Thank you so much. Gina, I'll tell you where I'm at. I think it's a great product. I think there's huge application. I think it is really unique and I totally get it. I think once the market understands what this is, this is going to be truly disruptive. I think a really great way to get some uh, cash generated quickly and some free marketing would be to hit TV shopping with this in a really big way. And if you hit TV shopping with this, which could happen imminently, you don't need to do that extra half a million of fundraise. You could fund generating that extra half a million in the next couple of months. So on that basis, because that is something that I can facilitate overnight, I would propose offering you half of the money, so £50,000, for 4% of the business. Thank you, Sarah. I might as well tell you, tell you where I am. <laughs> um, this is interesting for me because um, I'm making you an offer on the pure basis of FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm always straight and honest, so I have no idea why I'm doing this. <laughs> Only on the basis of the fact that Sara is so <laughs> in it and really loved it so much. And I trust her instincts. Um, so I'm going to make you the exactly the same offer that Sara did, which is £50,000 for 4%. Thank you. Gina, so there's lots of positive points which is the product, you, the background. The question mark is control and spend. Yeah. Because if that gets out of, out of hand, you'll make no money. Definitely in retail. And I think that's where I can help. So, um, I'm going to make you an offer. So I'm going to offer you half the money at the same 4% give you a food for thought. Thank you so much. I'm going to tell you where I am. I feel like, first of all, you're really good. Um, all you've got, to, I know this will sound ridiculous, all you've got to do is get the messaging right. Yeah. Just people need to know about it, that is it, yeah. because everything else is right. So, um, yeah, I'm going to make you an offer. Uh, and I, too, am going to offer you £50,000 for 4% of the business. Thank you. What, would you like to go to the wall? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. A flurry of four identical offers for Gina. This bit is nail biting. <laughs> that was a good one. Peter Jones, Tuka Suleiman, Deborah Meaden, and Sarah Davies have each offered half the money in return for 4% of the business. Honestly, Sarah, it was your, your nails are the only reason I paused but any joint deal would see the former investment banker give away twice the equity she's offering. I think she's going to come back and absolutely negotiate like a savage. Thank you all for your offers. Um, Sarah and Deborah, would you be willing to share? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you need a guy on this journey. You need somebody that doesn't know about this business that will give you the proper constructive criticism. Well, I mean, that's Deborah a would very really interesting the that Can we can confirm, what are you asking them to share? So 50 um, each. So what we've offered. Yes, but would you be willing to go down to 3% each? I don't think that there is a need for us to drop. And my concern is I would have 4% today yeah. I've no doubt you are going to need to fundraise. So if I'm lucky, I'm going to be owning 2% or 1% mm -hmm. 
at the exit value of the business. I thought you said you wouldn't have to fundraise. Yeah, no, not, this, not no, this round. I'm talking down the line. You know, you know it. When we're doing 25 million, we're going to need to fundraise. Yes. What I want to say is I'll just give you all the money for 8%, but I know that you need a lot of help. Yeah. So, Deborah and I would be willing to share on the basis that we offered at 8% between us of 4% each. Have we got a deal? Let's do it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh, yes. Success for Gina. Thank you. Well done. So much. Securing a deal with a fearsome duo of dragons. I'll give you a manicure tonight. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> she departs the den with a six-figure investment to help extend her nail business to whole new levels. It's really surreal to think that Glaze will now have two of the most prominent female investors in the UK. That just blows my mind, and I just feel really, really lucky. We nailed that, Deborah. Oh, oh wow. Boom, boom. <laughs> Here we are. My name is Stephen. I come from Leitrim, which is a small county in the northwest of Ireland. Oh my goodness. And I am bringing something into the Dragons today that solves problems for many young readers. Series of books, yeah? To help demonstrate the product, Stephen has brought along one of his customers, nine-year-old Laurel. What's 50 plus 60? I don't know what's 50 plus 60. What do, you, what do you think it is? 110. Well done. He's hoping she can bolster the moral support that his own offspring have afforded him. My three-year-old is delighted that I'm going to see dragons. My seven-year-old thinks that I am the best in the world. My 12-year-old boy probably doesn't even know that I'm coming, even though I've told him a million times. And then my almost 14-year-old daughter is probably mortified. And that sums up my family. <laughs> Hello, Dragons. My name is Stephen Keane. I am founder and director of Audio Mag Media, a children's magazine publishing company in the northwest of Ireland. Today, I come seeking £75,000 in exchange for 10% of our company. Audiomag Media specialises in accessible and inclusive content. It's for all children. But we place the needs of marginalised readers at the very centre of all we do. I'm talking about children with learning difficulties like dyslexia and with print disabilities, visual impairment or blindness. We said that if we could combine the needs of the dyslexic reader with the needs of a visually impaired or blind reader, that we could welcome children of all levels and abilities and additional needs when it comes to reading. In February 2020, we met with the Dyslexia Association of Ireland and with the National Council for the Blind of Ireland, and we shared our vision of creating an accessible magazine for children. And they offered a huge amount of advice, support, help, but perhaps most important of all, they gave us access to the young members so that we could inform our production, our creation, through empirical knowledge and feedback. So the Fact Factory uh, that you're seeing here today is a 12-part magazine series, and it offers readers of all abilities the choice to read, read along, or to listen to the magazine. I'm going to hand over to Laurel. She's going to just tell you a little bit about the magazine, and she's here with her mum, Laura. Thank you, Dragons. Hi. Hi, Laurel. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to turn on the pen and how to use it. We're going to press this button and wait till it turns green, and, and then we're going to scan it over the sticker. Fact number five. The palace has four floors with over 1,100 rooms and 4.8 kilometres of passageways. I really like this magazine because it's the first magazine that I've been able to access and I can read along with a friend. Laurel, you had your finger on the book. Is there a reason you were doing that? Yes, um, it's because there's a sticker kind of like raised up a tiny bit from the page and it helps me locate the writing to scan it over it. I listen to the audio and then search for the next sticker. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much, Laurel. Great demonstration. 
See Bye. See you. Good, Bye. Luck. Good luck. You will survive this. <laughs> So, Dragons, underneath your chairs, you're going to find a Fact Factory reading kit. Oh. It looks a little bit like a pizza box, but it's a takeaway for the mind rather than the, the belly. An audio magazine with a talking pen to make reading more accessible and inclusive for children is the proposition from Stephen Keane. So you just tap the audio icons and then listen to the content. Fact Factory, the most fun and interactive magazine in the universe. Stephen's asking for £75,000 in exchange for 10% of his company. Any sticker has an audio file behind it. It works really well. Sarah Davies is first to find out if the audio magazine could be a sound investment. So, Steve. Yes. Is it Steve or Stephen? It's actually Stevie, but Stephen Stevie. or Stevie, yeah. Well, then we'll do Stevie. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, well, that was an impressive pitch. Yes, and I yeah. certainly understand the need for the product and how you're fitting a niche in the market. So who is your target market for this? Is it the parents or is it schools? Yes, good question. The parents are the last people we want to go to. And that might sound very strange, but we created a free-to-read pledge. So even though we know that there are parents out there that have money to spend on this kind of kit, we really feel that to reach the children most in need, if we can convince libraries and schools to take our kits on board, we know that that creates these corridors of accessibility to families that may not be in a position to buy a kit. Stevie, hi. What's the price points? OK, so the 12-part kit that comes in the box with pen and charger, it costs £195. OK, so you're expecting, if I'm in a school, I will buy a kit, it will turn up with 12 magazines, yes. and then I can use those across the school. Yes, but what we love about it is you could buy one kit and three pens, so that it's multi-user. And when I lose a pen, how much is that going to cost me to replace? £45. £45. Goodness me, I'm going to keep my eye on those pens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK, um, this feels very personal for you. Mm -hmm. What got you into it? Because th you care about this, so what, what got you into it? Well, I'm a teacher by trade, and I have four children at home, and they're all avid readers. And sometimes you worry about the things that you could have done better as a parent. But one thing we seem to have done right is instill a love of reading. And that is hugely powerful, not just for me as a person, but for children. There's, there's a quote um, from a report, and it says, the single biggest factor to determine a child's future success is reading for pleasure. Like, isn't that amazing that reading for pleasure can determine a child's success over uh, economical status, uh, education of their parents. So we've developed a magazine series for everybody. Stevie, so have you actually made any money doing this yet? Yes. So the first issue was released in October 2022. And to date, we have sold €100,000 worth of kits in Ireland, which equates to around £86,000. So the €100,000 of sales you've made to date yes. have been made to educational establishments? Schools and public libraries. We also have a licensing deal signed with Gridmark um, International, and I'll explain them because they're actually our tech partner. Mm -hmm. It's a Japanese tech company, and they own the pen and all the rights to the pen. And we have a licensing deal in place with them. So we provide the content, they provide the pen. Stephen. Um uh, firstly, I want to say congratulations coming up with a very clear product and, boy, this should get out there. There's no doubt about it. However, I kind of sunk in my chair when you said that a Japanese company owned this. Pen, yes. And this was the uniqueness, I think, of this product. OK. So talk to me about how do you, how do you create a business out of something like this when you ultimately don't own the rights to the product apart from a licensing arrangement where ultimately licensing is great but you've got to come up with the invention first and you haven't yes well i, I guess we are yeah and, and i'm not hiding behind that but i think we have a very sound partnership in place sorry can i just check is an exclusive license it isn't an exclusive no. license so we're free that's, yeah, to that's what i'm sitting here but I, I think that worked in our favor peter in that we're free to so there are similar pens out there that can read yes. that technology. So we're free to partner with anybody. 
but we have a five-year contract with Gridmark and we're very happy with Gridmark. They've been hugely supportive of what we're doing. Stevie, if one of those big publishers out there decides they want to start putting stickers into their books that read the books for the, the pupil, is there anything in your contract that stops them doing that? No, there'll be no excl I mean, the market is free to entry for all publishers, but Gridmark have agreed that they will not take on a magazine series like ours. So if I went to Gridmark with a big amount of money, mm -hmm. five million quid, and I said I want to do a magazine series in the UK, they wouldn't do it? They have told me that they wouldn't do it. But you don't have that in writing? Uh, There's I've... no contract. There's no legal requirement for them to turn me down. I am not sure if it is in writing, but I would be slightly confident. I would be confident that I could get in writing because it has been verbally agreed. But I do appreciate what you're asking there, Stephen. So you have not got an exclusive in the UK? On... He hasn't got exclusive at all. Stevie, Stevie. I think, look, I, I genuinely think this is just admirable. But you have a really tough job of trying to now find a way to make this a business. What ring fences your idea is the fact that you've got some form of protection, and that protection comes with some form of exclusivity, and you haven't got that. And I think that's your issue. I think you need to go back, but negotiate harder. Because this is not defensible, and if it's not defensible, you're going to struggle to get any investment from anybody. Peter, it's the first phone call I'm going to make. It, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, so I'm going to wish you the best of luck, but sadly, I'm out. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So I, I, I also worry for you, Stevie. I'm afraid that it makes it very difficult as an investor. Love what you do. Love you and your passion for this but I, I'm afraid I can't find a way of investing, so I'm out. Thank you, Deborah. Look, I love your passion, Steve, but when I look at this, the main thing is the pen technology. And eventually, what will happen is there'll be a 499 or 999 version of that pen, which, which will then be used in other areas. So, unfortunately, what you've pitched today is not investable. OK. And for that reason, I'm out. Stevie, if you'd come here today and you told me that you'd built technology that allowed all the existing books that have been written for children to become accessible to people that struggle with reading, um, that, would have, that would have blown my mind and been an incredibly scalable proposition. I find it a little bit less scalable for you to be producing the, the literature yourself um, and then using someone else's technology for that. Your mission is not just admirable, it's incredibly important, but I'm not convinced that you have an investable business because I question whether it's gonna be able to scale in the near future. I implore you to carry on doing what you're doing, but I'm gonna say that I'm out. These are the nicest no's I've ever had, but <laughs> I really appreciate it. And thank you, Stephen, and I do appreciate that. Stevie, you are so lovely. You, <laughs> you really are, and, and you're so passionate mm. about how you are going to change the world. <laughs> no, no, yeah. you really are. The difficulty for us sitting here is we get offered hundreds of investments. Of course. And for us, it's looking at where is it going to be best for us to place our money and time investment mm. to give the greatest return. And I, I just don't feel like the most important thing here is for you to make a big profitable return. Mm -hmm. The most important thing here is for you to reach the most children and, and it, it's going to be at loggerheads with any investor you ever bring in. So okay. I'm going to say as an investment for me today, I'm out. What good luck with the business. Thanks very much, Sarah. I appreciate that. Thank you, Stevie. Thanks very much. Thank you. I good luck. I really Thank appreciate you. it. That's it for Stephen, who departs the den without the investment he was looking for. Mixed emotions. We didn't get the offer that we had asked for. It wasn't for them. But I think we'll come away the better company from this, without a doubt. When the passion for the vision is greater than the passion for business and making money, it's really humbling sometimes. The future is bright, definitely, and I look forward to proving them wrong. <laughs> yeah.
There we go. How's my hair look? Your hair looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Louise Toll and I'm from Shropshire. And I'm Ian Toll. And we are a husband and wife team and we watch dogs dislocate their owner's arms to try our product out. Do you know your parts, dogs? Don't forget what you're going to say, Phoebe. Owl. Oh, gosh, yeah. Owl. <laughs> Owl. It's a dog treat. I thought it was breakfast cereal for dogs at first. It does. It looks like Cocoa Pops, doesn't it? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Looks like there's little variety packs. I'm really excited to be a part of the show and in the den, but also slightly nervous and intimidated, I think. I think we're both nervous, but I, to be honest, I'm just incredibly proud of the journey that Louise and I have been on and how well she's done, so the future is endless. Oh. Oldie. Dogs are so much better than humans. Hello, dragons. My name is Louise Toll. And I'm Ian Toll. And we are the owners of Third Boost. Boost. Today, we're seeking £50,000 investment for a 10% equity stake in our company. Fur Boost is a functional smoothie hydration drink for dogs. Each drink contains a meat, fruit and vegetable blended with added oils and vitamins. So not only does the product hydrate the dog, it also adds functionality, supporting the dog's well-being, helping with skin and coat, digestion, immunity, anxiety and the metabolism. The drinks come in three tasty flavours. We have beef, broccoli and blueberry, pork, sweet potato and apple, chicken, butternut, squash and cranberry. And uh, this is a product, it's not something copied from something with a twist of lemon. This was actually created for a need. That's right, and that need came when Phoebe, our now 10-year-old beagle, fell ill at 18 months of age. I worked alongside the vet and we changed her diet. But it was in the summer months when I needed Phoebe to drink and she wasn't drinking, so I called upon my technical background as a food science and technologist to create protein shakes for her, which she found highly palatable. It helped then flush the issue away and we put that down to her being properly hydrated. To date, we've produced 120,000 units feeding thousands of dogs based in the UK. Uh... I'll demonstrate the product and hopefully a few bit will enjoy this. A range of flavoured drinks for dogs is the offering from Louise and Ian Toll. So the product's ready to drink. There we go. Oh, I've done the job, quieting them down. Mm -hmm. In return for an investment of £50,000, a 10% stake is on offer. Was that good, Phoebe? Oh, yeah. OK. Well, I don't think we've got any questions for your dogs. Okay, so. Alison, thank you, Alison. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Maybe we can say thank you. Phoebe and Frankie exit the den, leaving Peter Jones thirsty to get down to business. It's nice when, a, almost like the pitch and the demonstration, it, you get it in one, don't you? <laughs> and the, clearly, Phoebe and her friend love the product, so... If I just look back, how long has this been going for? How long have you had the product? Well, Louise came up with the idea years ago when Phoebe yeah. was ill, as we talked about. Um, I then, for, I spent the last eight years working internationally based in the Middle East, and Louise came out and put that on hold, really, for a year or so when we first met to Kuwait. Um, but never stopped you thinking. And then uh, in 2020, we decided to build the factory. We put the factory together in the end of 2020 and launched in 2021. So 21 was our first OK, so 2021. So what are you doing in the Middle East? I've worked in the food industry for 36 years. Uh, I've run manufacturing plants, I've run restaurants. So I've, I've been a CEO for the last 16 years. For who? For who? I was the group president for Al Shire, so I ran brands like the Cheesecake Factory, Shake Shack, P.F. Chang's, Texas Road, Hastin and Duluth. 29 brands in 12 countries. What I'm really keen to get into is the numbers. So, 2021, what were the sales in 2021? The sales were very modest. Uh, I think 17,500 with a gross profit of 9,500. In 2022, we actually, our sales jumped to 77,000, just over. 77 k And, but this is the year, if we made a mistake, we didn't make a mistake. I was, this is the year, I was still locked into the Middle East and Louise had a baby in the, in the year of 2021, so it's quite distracting. Um, but during that year, just so you know, even though she had a baby, she still managed to do 
I think it was five or six shows. Done. Ian, I can tell it's beautiful. You're a husband. You're so proud. That's wonderful. I'm super proud, yeah. But I would just want the numbers. Sure. So, so 2022... We 2022, 77K revenue. Correct. GP? GP was 53%. We lost 100,000. 100K? Yeah. OK. You mentioned that you made some mistakes. I find that really compelling because, you know, a lot of startups don't get to survive their mistakes that they yeah. make. Um, what was the mistake you made? The mistake we made was we actually overspent our marketing. We, we actually went with some well-known names and we spent 50, 100,000 pounds on some campaigns and got very little return. Just out of interest, what, what is the key lesson you took from that? I think the one thing, and you, you really honed in on this, I'll let you add to this, is we changed our model now. We have three part-time uh, consultants who work for us, but we get great value for money out of them and we've really learned from the mistakes we made. The key, key lesson there for me, as I've heard it, is when you're a young company, you have to be as close as possible to the Absolutely. marketing. Absolutely. You have to have it in your walls to understand yeah. Yeah. where every pound being spent is returning for you. Absolutely. Positively or negatively. Can I test something with you? You can. Are you happy with the brand? Yes, I'm happy with the brand. Um, it's quite catchy, so um, we do have a lot of interest and people like it because it stands out on shelf. So, yeah. You don't like the brand? Um, I think it, it looks limiting. So I think this has got a lot of benefits to it, and none of which it looks like fur boost, which looks like something that's going to improve your dog's coat. I just think it undersells, because you're a big solution. We had different names for it when we started this, but we actually spent, I don't know, spent 30 grand on, on focus groups to actually figure out the brand name. How much? Rightly or wrongly. I've got heart palpitations when you said you spent 30k on focus groups. I know. Groups. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. I, but, I, but it leads me to another question. Um, are you capable of doing some things on a shoestring? Sorry? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'm, I'm not quite... sure Ian is, because <laughs> he didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Never needed to. <laughs> yes, but we've... Yeah, That's... but I, it, it's interesting because not everything in a business, you know, you've got to know what it's important to spend your money on. You've also got to know what it's not in, it's important to not spend your money yeah. on, you know. Yeah. That's why I'm asking you the question. The mistakes we, we we openly said we spent too much money on marketing with big companies in 2021. We're not doing that now. Yeah. And, you know, we both come from a very corporate background, so we did things that we were taught to do. We're not doing those anymore. We're figuring out how do we do it so it makes money. Ian and Louise, you probably know I'm in the pet business. Um, interesting, um, what does it sell for? Four pounds. Four, Four pounds. pounds. I mean, I, I, I look at this and I say, is it something which somebody would pay four pounds um, and you've got a lot of transport with the water? Could this be produced in powder format where you just add water uh, and mix it. It could be done that way, um, but we believe that when you're um, adding further costs and further processing, um, and you're taking out some of the um, ingredients into powder form, you're actually losing that palatability as well. But I think it's easier for somebody that, you know, you open a tin or whatever, you put a scoop in, put the water in. Yeah. This is, this is what's tearing me at four pounds. Is that value for the mainstream dog owner. The beauty of having, sorry, just to interrupt, the beauty of having the carton in its liquid form is it's ready to drink. So it is great for grab and go, which is used for a lot. And when people travel. But it's expensive. It is, but you can use as little or as much as you want. No. You don't have to use the whole carton. Yeah, but you've got to use it within seven days. So, so well, what, what... Not necessarily, you can still freeze it as well. So it's freezable. And we do say to people, if you're not going to use it in seven days, don't waste it, freeze it. I view this business and I look at it as a, as a risk equation. I completely believe in the product. Yeah. But when I look at that risk equation, on one side I have an unprofitable business, and on the other side, to balance out that equation, I would then look for a tremendous potential upside. That tremendous potential upside would be an eight, nine figure business. And I can't quite see that. And because I can't see that, and the risk equation isn't balanced, I'm gonna say that I'm out, but I wish you the best. Thank you. Okay. Um, I completely agree. So I think you'll I, you'll make money out of it, but I don't see. I guess it's what you're saying, really, Stephen. I don't see the super. You know, I don't see this sure. taking over the world. So wish you all the best. 
Um, but I won't be investing. I'm out. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Look, I think it's been really good to listen to, to two people's journey that clearly you're really professional and there's no doubt and very investable. The reason why I'm not going to invest, though, is that I think that this is going to be a very tough business to scale. So I'm going to say, sadly, that I'm out. OK, thank you. So I'll tell you what, Louise Neal, I'll tell you where I am. I think you're pioneering into a completely different field, but my understanding and knowledge of this is so limited, I would worry that I would be more of a hindrance than a help on this journey with you. So I'm going to say on this occasion, I won't be investing today, thank you, and I'm out. Thank you. Ian and Louise, have you ever had one of the big four or one of the big six supermarkets approach you? Yes. Yeah. Which one? Waitrose. And how far have you gone with them? At the moment, we've sent, we've sent samples. Yeah. Um, and the buyer did email to say that they were managing to manage our expectation. She's tasked with reducing her supplier base by fifteen percent. Of course. It, doesn't, it does not mean that they've got the right suppliers. I mean, I'm, I, I'm very close to one major retailer, got 800 stores, who could transform this overnight if they liked it. I'm torn. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. So uh, I, I, I'm going to make you an offer. And, and what, what I'm offering here is really support, one, but contacts with the big supermarkets. If they like it, they just buy it. And that will transform the business. Mm -hmm. However, it comes at a price. So I'll give you the whole 50,000, but I want 35%. If I get my money back within 12 months, I'll drop down to 25%. Do you want to speak to the wall? Yeah. <laughs> Is okay. that all right? right. <laughs> An offer from retail royalty to Kasuliman, albeit at three times the equity that was originally on the table. Would you walk away? I don't know. What do you want to do? But will Ian and Louise risk the opportunity by bargaining for better terms? They just wanted to cancel that to say, if you would take 30%, for the 50,000. Mm -hmm. If we give you your 50,000 back within 12 months, drop that to 20%, we'd be happy to accept that. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll send them in the vibes. Okay. Louise and Ian seal the deal. Thank you. Well, I'm going to use your brains yeah. and, your, and we'll make this work. Thank you very Perfect. much. That's okay. fantastic. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well done. Well Thank you, Louise. Well well Congratulations. The entrepreneurs leave the den with £50,000 and the backing of a dragon with retail expertise to help grow their business. There you go. Oh, my leg's gone dead. <laughs> Tuka, um, I did think he was going to back out. So I was just like, no, we haven't got a dragon. And then when he offered, but I'm really pleased we've got a dragon. I feel mm. drained. <laughs> There's the pub. Oh. <laughs> One more to the year. That's good, that. I think, I think they got a good deal. I think you've got a good deal. Win-win. Yeah. Woof, woof. Hi, I'm Abir. I'm 33 years old. I'm originally from Canada. I've been living in the UK for the last seven years. I saw a gap in the market and I filled it with something comfortable. I always say my wife is my muse. Uh, she is the person that is most obsessed with her comfort. And if my wife loves it, I think the dragons are going to love it as well. Well, they look oh, comfy. They do. Is it the blankets or is it the beanie? Might be both. They're weighted blankets. It's got the weight on it, 6 kg. What's the point of putting weight on top when you're sleeping? It, it calms oh. you.
Hi, Dragons. I'm Abir, and I'm the founder of Remy, the go-to brand for ultimate relaxation. We're on a mission to bring rest to a hectic and stress-filled world. Like millions of others, I was overworked in a corporate job and a victim of the hustle culture. Four years ago, I chose to leave that corporate world, took a leap of faith to launch a brand that embraces rest and relaxation. I'm here today seeking 80,000 pounds for 5% of my business to solve this rest problem. To do this, I've reinvented the beanbag and created the pod. With its high quality materials and ergonomic design, the pod molds around your body. I've designed it with modern day living in mind for it to be the most comfortable piece of furniture you'll ever sit on, especially after a long day's work. Um, honestly, it feels like you're floating on a cloud. But that's not all. What really sets us apart is a buying journey we've created online. This allows a customer to put their own personal touch on what will soon be their favorite seat on the house. And to elevate the entire relaxation experience, they can get accessories, an accessory like a footrest, a neck pillow, or one of our famous weighted blankets. Thank you so much for your time and this opportunity. I'd love to demo the product before inviting someone to come up. You're gonna demo it first. I'll demo it first. <laughs> you can sit on it, you can sit upright, you can recline back, or you can lay completely flat on it. Abir, I want to show Peter the weighted blankets. He's never yeah, go experienced ahead. it before. So if you just pop yourself down there. A business with comfort at its heart. Oh, wow. Furnished by beanbag style pods and weighted blankets is the proposition from Abir Rikbal. I can also put the weighted blanket on you, Peter. Yeah. I'll tuck him in. Have a seat, Tuka. Whoa. Abir yeah. is seeking 80,000 pounds. Good night, Stephen in return for 5% of his business. This might have been a fatal mistake to put your dragons to sleep before we start the pitches. Wakey, wakey! Peter Jones and Stephen Bartlett might be resting their eyes, but the den is never a place where an entrepreneur can relax. Abir, while these two dragons are sleeping, I'm going to start with the questions. What's inside the product? Yeah, so it's uh, expanded uh, polystyrene beads. Poly? Polystyrene beads, so EPS beads. Polystyrene. Polystyrene, sorry, polystyrene. that's my accent. So this is four years old, this business. How much did you invest in this business to start with? Yeah, so I've put in 200,000 over 200, the last four years. Yep. Right, OK. Let's, before we talk about numbers, let's talk about cost. So uh, if you take the large one, what does that cost you? So it cost us uh, 40, 40 to 45 pounds for the final product landed. Right, how much did you sell it for? 139. So I, I'm looking at this now and you've got no margin for retail because 139 retail, 40, 45 costs. If you knock off the VAT, you've got no margin for retail. It's 60 to 65%. Yeah, yeah. So you're an online play, correct? Uh, right now we're 100% online. So just, just give us some numbers to, to get a feel of the trend of online, because I'm a bit worried that online sales are dipping. Mm -hmm. I want to know if it's affecting you or not. Yeah, so you're when we launched halfway through the year. We did 300,000 pounds in revenue and a net profit of 45K. Uh, in year two, we did 750,000 turnover yeah. and net of 35,000. In year three, uh, post-COVID is a tough yeah. year for us. We did 670 yeah. turnover and a net loss of 110,000. Yeah. And, and then last year, we did 825K in yeah. revenue, and we had a net loss of 25,000. See, over lockdown and COVID, everybody went online. And, and there's this big phenomenon that online marketing is so profitable. I don't believe so. I think the cost of acquiring a customer online is too great. And in a way, you've given yourself no margin for retail. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck with online. Profitability might well be difficult going forward. How are you going to cope with that? I can talk to you about uh, our marketing online. It costs us around 35 to 40 pounds to acquire a customer right now, which leaves us with a 15 to 20% margin at the end of it. So we're always first sale profitable on our beanbags when someone's buying it online. Abir, where, when you say online, what's the, what's the split between some of the big marketplaces and your own website? It's 98% our own website okay. and like 2% Amazon. Okay. 
Yeah, my background, I, I worked at Shopify for a few years. My background is direct to consumer e-commerce. That's where I've purely built the business. And in the last year, we really got product market fit. We've sold over 5,000 bean bags. Um, How about if you got product marketing fit? It doesn't look like you have because you're, you're losing money. And online marketing can be difficult, especially when you're a slight iteration in a saturated market. And that's exactly what you are, to be honest. Because I've had weighted blankets before. I've had great ones. I've had bean bags before. Your, yours might be marginally better, but that's not a significant enough point of difference to drive a huge upside on your digital marketing. So what's the story online? How, how do you sell this to people? So our customers choose us for three main reasons. The first is the versatility. Customers are looking for multifunctional furniture with the prevalence of working from home. You know, I showed it, you can sit upright, you can recline back, or you can lay completely flat. That's a bean bag. Yeah, but the, the second thing is the moldability, which another bean bag, if you just sit on it, you just kind of That's fall a bean and bag. sink. Bean bags mold. <laughs> and the, the third part is the personalization option. So we've developed on our website a way for someone to customize their bean bag. Personalization is like type of cover that they want, so they can choose color, cover, uh, material, and then like building their experience around the pod. A beer, hi. hi. Um, you mentioned that you were at Shopify. What did you do there? Yeah, so I worked on Shopify Plus, which was brands that do over a million a year. Yeah. Um, so there was, I was on the larger segment, so people that were doing, anyone that was on Shopify Plus had to do a million a year. So I advised brands uh, here in the UK on how to scale uh, their business D2C and how to expand globally as well. And any regrets leaving? No, not at all. Um, I was tired of the corporate grind, to be honest. Um, I found my calling. This is an industry that I'm really passionate about, the rest space in general. And although we haven't had turned a profit last year, we were profitable from year one and year two. Your sales then look like rolling. You're averaging around 17K a week. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, yeah. So how do we get this to 100, 200K a week? So there's three growth levers that I'd like to explore that we haven't yet. Um, the first is licensing, uh, global expansion, and then retail distribution. So I just want to focus in on this global expansion piece. For sure. We're expanding into the US, and that's a really big market for us. There's a company in the US that's doing 20 million a year, purely just selling a similar product to us without the customization option that we have. The way that I'm looking at it is that if we can replicate in the US what we've built online here in the UK, we're just getting a bigger piece of the pie. Abir, I don't think you thought this through 100%. I think your business, although the product might be great, has flaws in the model. Because I think online, you've proven that you can't make money. You've made money once, haven't you, in four years? Or have you Twice, called? the first two years, yeah. First two years, but, you, but you've been going for four years and you've done 800 prior. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. Four years of your valuable life has passed by. If you spend a lot of money and you're not getting it back, yeah. something's not right. And I believe that you put more money in your same model, mm -hmm. you'll lose more money. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, I'm out. Abia, I have to say I do agree with Tuga. Finally! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Good job, I was sitting down for that. <laughs> Finally. No, Finally. I do. You know, I've spent a decade optimising marketing funnels and I, I look at this and go, we're not going to be able to optimise this product. No. To, 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 to get, get it to a place where it will return on investment, we, we won't be able to get there with this product. Because there's, there's just nothing that I consider to be proprietary, innovative, compelling, and I really wish someone like you had put their talent behind something that was more difficult, to be honest, less saturated, but there's no way that I'm gonna invest in this business today because I can't see which lever we're gonna be able to pull together to send this to the place it needs to go to to give me a return. I'm gonna say that I'm out, but I wish you the very best of you. Um, I just want to explore the sustainability piece. Polystyrene, nasty stuff. I know. Is there a good polystyrene? There isn't. No. Um, it's really tough right now to find something sustainable. OK. So I'm never going to invest in a polystyrene-filled mm -hmm. bag. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
to be honest, um, you, I think, could sell anything, and I actually wish you were selling something else. So if you have an epiphany one day, <laughs> and you wake up and you think, you know what? Polystyrene balls are not a good idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something that is really gonna have a really good impact. Please, please find me. <laughs> I give you a call. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> but this isn't it, I'm afraid, so I'm out. Thanks, Deborah. Abir, the skill of the individual in front of me isn't matching the 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 opportunity. And to Deborah's point, find something else you can do. Mm -hmm. And if all else fails, you can always knock on my door with your experience, and <laughs> you'd be looking at a six a six figure job, and uh, and, and a lot of cash. So, but it's not an investment to what everybody else has said. So I'm going to say that I'm out. But it's good to meet you. Just me left. Yes, yeah, sir. Um. Do you know, I, I actually just fundamentally don't agree with a, a lot of what I've heard here. What I see in front of me is someone who, yes, is great at the e-commerce side of things, but gave up a career in corporate because he was passionate about this area. And if there's one thing I know about business, is that you will succeed when you pursue the thing you're passionate about. The issue I have with the business is purely the valuation. £80,000 for 5% isn't really floating my boat. Now, I can change the valuation, but I, I've got to weigh up, am I passionate about the same thing that you're passionate about, no. to want to go on that journey with you? And it's not my passion. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't discourage you from pursuing what is your passion, because you clearly love this business, and I think you're doing a lot of the right stuff. Thanks, so. so I would say keep doing it. I don't want to invest today, and I'm going to say I'm out. Well, good luck. Thanks, you guys. Good luck. Thank good you. Luck, Thank you for your Thank time you. so much. A beer must leave the den empty-handed. But even if his business failed to win over the dragons, the entrepreneur himself impressed. It was nice for me to see that they believed in me as an individual and my skill set. Um, disappointed that I didn't get a deal out of it, but I do believe that they missed out on an opportunity. I wish you'd walked in and said, I'll give you 5% of my next business. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we will, we will rock you. Next time on Dragon's Den. Dragon's Den is the platform to come in and pitch anything. <laughs> You've made some really good decisions so far. I would have been shouting that coming out of the <laughs> How can you prove that it helps? Well, I can just tell you that, you know, it, it helped me. That's what worries me. OK, that's of no use to me whatsoever. <laughs> you are in a bit of a pickle financially at the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, EastEnders. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs>